Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Sharon Koifman about designing effective work in an online environment. Jerome Koifman, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Uh, pleasure, Jonathan. Excited yeah, great, to be here. Great to be with you today. I'm so excited to have this conversation. You're joining me from Montreal. I'm here south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Today, we're going to be talking about all things related to remote work. Uh, that's your area of expertise and the work that you and your firm do in helping organizations navigate uh, this complicated uh context that we're in right now. Now, clearly remote work isn't brand new. People have been doing remote work and telework for decades. uh, And increasingly, there's been more and more technologies that have enhanced the ability to do remote work, uh, even pre-pandemic. But there's no question that the pandemic accelerated us into the world of remote work and more and more organizations, leaders, and their, their people who may have been resistant to a remote environment have been forced to to figure it out and how to do it. Um, some have done it more effectively than others, and uh, and now we're in this situation where you know perhaps we're moving back into more of a face to face workforce or or a hybrid kind of a workforce. And what's the role of remote work as we move into the future of work? And we continue to see technological disruptions that kind of shake up the very nature of work and what we've traditionally known. Uh, as the way we do our work with our organization. So these are all the things that we'll be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Sharon's bio with everybody. Sharon Koifman is the CEO of Distant Job Remote Placement Agency, the author of Surviving Remote Work, and the newly launched Think Remote, a company focused on remote work that catered, informs, and entertains. Sharon is an expert on helping people with their work from home strategies helping companies with remote employees and making the remote world more enjoyable and productive for all. Based on his 20 years of experience of running companies remotely, he is an expert at helping people not only survive, but thrive during these times. Sharon believes that working from home is more productive than an office setting. He wrote his entire book while being a stay-at-home dad and understands the struggles many people face. I love it. I love your background. Uh, I'm excited to get your insights uh, and appreciate you being willing to share those with me and my listeners. Anything else you would like to share uh, by way of your background before we jump on into the conversation? Yes, um, maybe the the only thing that is not mentioned in this lovely bio is that I actually been doing this for 20 years. I've been running companies from my from my computer for 20 years and I've been running distant job, uh, the, which is the first remote recruitment agency in the world about for 12 years. And In those 20 years, I didn't do some affiliate programs or some mini kind of marketing thing. Those are more tangible services with employees and products and everything. And it's always done for my computer. And that's why I'm sharing all that experience today. Yeah, that's wonderful. So you have decades of experience doing something that is really still quite new for many. And many people are are still struggling with uh, figuring out how to do it effectively, right? Yes. So as we dive on in, uh, maybe you can... Uh, say a little bit more about your your experience around this idea of productivity in a remote setting. Uh, as I read in your bio, you know you're a believer in uh, the productivity gains that come from flexible remote work arrangements. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, your experience with that, and then we can start uh, getting into more about how we might effectively design, manage, and lead within a remote kind of a environment. Okay, so first of all, in terms of productivity, there's, um, yes, there's a lot of uh, 
idea strategies to be more productive as a remote person. But in general, the the research have shown even in MIT Sloan has done research on on people that are remote that shown they're happier and more independent, which of course reflects on productivity. And there's a lot of research showing that that there is a huge advantage in managing distractions at home. I know that it's shocking because everybody thinks about home as being the place where you're close to the fridge and, and the kids and distraction. But in the cubicle environment that we often have in an office environment, with all those distracting meetings and all those tap on the shoulders, um, an average individual in an eight-hour shift produces about two hours and 53 minutes of actual work. Right, so so it's not it's not that it's not that working from home has become this incredible, brilliant pro, pro, productivity solution. It's just that the office one really sucked, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and so so they there are issues in, in at home, but they actually did another research and and I've like on my on my website Think Remote we have many we have an entire book about stats showing how remote works better but but they I, one more example they had travel agents uh, during covid and they send them home and they were producing 33 percent more work and th- this happens in a- every establishment where it comes to coders where it comes to this because you are at least working in the most optimal working environment and you have capacity to reduce to reduce distraction you also have the capacity to to finish your work, you don't necessarily need to think at, at five o'clock or lunchtime where everybody needs to go for lunch or or at five o'clock when you have to go home, you got to cut the project in the middle. And every time that you have to cut any project in the middle, it takes forever to get back to focus. And actually, anytime that somebody distracts you, it takes 20 minutes to get back to focus work. And that's why people just produce about two hours and 53 minutes. Yeah, and, and that's the reality uh, for a lot of us in, in an office environment, especially if it's an open, op- open office environment, um, you know, with kind of the, the open uh, concept, workstations, cubicles, maybe a little less so, but still um, you can have lots of distractions. And even in a, an environment where you have like physical offices with doors and you can even shut your door, you still get all of those interruptions and those um, distractions. And people end up scheduling meetings that don't need to be scheduled. Uh, so you end up just wasting time in pointless meetings uh, that aren't really necessary. So there's a lot of reasons behind why being in a face-to-face environment can be problematic uh, for people as they're trying to be productive. Um, now, that's not to say that there's anything necessarily magical about being remote or being in person. You can design in-person work to be really productive and effective. It's just that many organizations, probably most organizations don't. So, so then it, you end up, the research is pretty clear. Like you said, there, I think that was a Harvard study that showed is under three hours of actual productivity <laughs> in, in one day. Uh, another Harvard study talked about, um, you know, the ideal work day is probably more like maybe six hours instead of eight hours. Um, and you, you referred to the, the MIT Sloan um, study. Like there's just so many uh, studies and so much research on this. Uh, that sh- should push us to like challenge our assumptions around the traditional nature of how we've designed jobs. Uh, why have we designed them that way? W- what are the benefits to it? What are the drawbacks to it? And how we- can we be more effective? Uh, I've, I've worked in an Asian work environment where you know people show up at 7.30 in the morning, they don't leave until 10 at night, and then they go you know to the karaoke bar and drink and whatever, and then they do yes. rinse and repeat, right? And I'm thinking, you're spending so much time. You're spending 14, 15 hours a day plus don't believe at, work, it. at work. How much is actually getting done? Now, having been in that environment myself, I know how much work was getting done. I saw how much work was getting done. And I suspect that for the vast majority of the people I worked with, that three hours or so was still probably about the mark. Um, and so what's all the other stuff? Like, what is all that? Why are we doing all of that? It's, it's just a symbol status, culture, whatever. And, and, and we are just the, the manage the management 
in the in the old school mentality of companies. I mean, I mean, there's there's a major challenge across the world, and for, forgive me for being so abrupt. The managers in general are not so great, right? Because if you do have a good manager, they will kick butt in in a remote environment. It doesn't change much. I actually do not believe that going remote changes much from the office environment. It really is all about the management, the, the management that is that that is um, motivating and teaching the people around. I mean, I personally think production is only as good as the management. And a lot of management has been taught to check that people come on time at nine, that leave at five, or they check who is really overproducing by staying in the office longer, which it really does not work because the real, real skilled managers, and this is very unique requirement, have the capacity to evaluate production. They actually know that this type of job should take this this uh, this length of time, and this is how much this individuals produce. But but this is a very hard and very unique skill that requires a long time to to master. Yeah. So so skilled leadership, skilled supervisory um, approaches, coaching, mentoring, providing effective feedback, like all those things that has more. Um, influence on whether or not, you know, people are going to be effective in the workplace, regardless of whether it's, you know, in-person, remote, hybrid, or whatever. And if you have a, if you have a bad manager, you're probably going to have a bad team and not productive, uh, regardless of the environment. Yeah. You can be the most productive person in the world. If you are working in a a distractive working environment, you're not going to be productive. This is, this is really the reality. I mean, I'm still blown away. You, You were talking about, about, cubicles and i was talking about cubicle also and and i have this senior accountant senior accountant friend that um is working for a reputable um um, accounting firm which i will not mention because that would not be very nice but um they made a decision five years ago to take all the management all the higher producing people and bring them to the cubicle so everybody will feel equal Oh my God, that is like the dumbest move I've ever heard in my life. You, not only your low end people are, are not productive and they're they're dreaming to graduate to an office, now you took your high, pro, uh, high producers and brought them into the same environment because you wanted to be uh, all this happy, social, dappy, schmappy uh, mentality. And they just completely, completely got it wrong. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. I guess one of the things I'm taking away from this conversation is that done well, remote can be very effective and, and in fact, can be more effective um, than an in-person or even a hybrid environment. Ultimately, though, it probably comes back to, is it designed well? Is it managed and led well? Um, and that is more important than regard, you know, regardless of the modality of how you connect or get the work done. And I know people you know, who 
they literally, when they're in especially higher level kind of roles where you can just get distracted all day long, you could spend all day, every day, just responding to other people's demands for your time instead of actually getting your work done, um, where they actually carve out like a, a day every week where they just, they go remote, not because they need to like be remote because they can't go into the office, but because they just need a day where they can just get work done, <laughs> where they're not around all the distractions. And so that's a pretty consistent thing though. They just do it just so they have at least one day a week where they can be productive. And then all the other days they can put out fires or whatever. Now that's, that's silly though. Like we shouldn't have to do that. That um, It should just be how the, the work is designed in the first place that we can have collaboration times. We can have productivity times and individual work times, we can have opportunities to check in with our people, opportunities to provide feedback and mentoring, like all of that can be structured and set up in how we do our work. And it doesn't really even matter whether it's in in person, remote, or, or hybrid. Um, one question that comes up a lot, and you know, I imagine some people would push back on what you're saying. And they would say, well, what about culture? What about what about sense of belonging? How do you help people feel engaged and, and like they're part of a team when they're working remotely and you have this distributed workforce, how would you respond to that kind of a question or argument? So, so I, I completely, um, I accept the cynicism, especially where it comes to, to the mental health, to the culture, to that discussion really is the big differentiator. I, again, I believe that remote work, um, in at home is significantly superior to uh, to work in an office, but there is that um, connection. That there is that 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 idea that people do need at least a, at least a good chunk of people do need their work environment to be their social experience, not to be the people that they're making friends with, to be the to, to be the place where they go for happy hour or the gym or for lunch and interact with people. So as one of my friends uh, said, uh, one of my friends who's a big advocate for working in an office is when I go to an office, I know I come back home and I feel like not only I did good work, I also had my social experience. So I'm happy to come back to a family while remote people do struggle with that. And again, this also has a lot to do with the management because um, for, first thing, first thing, a, a good manager, beside being able to evaluate the production, needs to get a lot more intimate with the, the remote people because that, in my opinion, is the big differentiator. That the, the, um, the, the managers should invest more in knowing and understanding and connecting with their people because that is that is the only way you know you get to know if your people get burnt out if the people feel motivated by actually becoming their friends I, it's a big often in many company cultures it's a big no no for the manager or for the boss to be friends with their employees in remote in my opinion it should be almost an absolute requirement right well, you and, have to. and i think you know some people might get turned off by the use of the term friend uh, let's, let's change the, the terminology in case anyone has a mental block to that. And let's just say to be an effective leader, you need to know your people to be an effective leader. You have to build relationships of a mutual accountability and trust with your people to be an effective leader like that. with it, to be an effective leader. You have to be vulnerable and give your people permission to be vulnerable back to you, um, in order to you know, to, to meet their needs and, and be supportive in the ways you need to be supportive. To be an effective leader, you have to show empathy and compassion. So all of these things that I'm saying to be an effective leader, like we, those are also characteristics of a good friend. <laughs> so no, he, I like wh- that. Wh- whether, whether, whether you say you need to be friends with people at work or whether you rephrase it, the, the same concept is at play. You need to know your people. You need to have a psychologically safe environment where people can trust you, where they can come to you, where you can support them. They can feel supported, et cetera. And that only happens when you have that interpersonal connectivity with your people. So this kind of old model, you got the, the, the leader in the corner office. They're kind of the distant, stoic, you know, kind of harsh person everyone's scared of. Like that kind of a model for leadership 
I, I question whether that was ever the best thing. Um, but perhaps in a, in previous generations in a different kind of an environment with a different type of work, yep. per, perhaps you be so good at evaluating work. If yeah. you want to go th- that direction, yeah. there is sure. room for those people. There is yeah. room for a Steve jobs kind of person. It was not, it was incredibly inspiring, motivating, but it was not very nice. Right. Yeah. But people wanted to do things for, for him because it was inspiring, and motivating. If, well, and, if, and people like Steve Jobs had other people around them to do the other aspects of leadership that he wasn't doing. Right. Yes, exactly. And, and but that, that's so. So that's the thing. If the more you get personal with the more you you get personal, you 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 understand the people that you work with, the less you need to be an an a skilled tactician or a, a skilled evaluator of work because you have more trust with the people that you have. So it gives you it, it, being good with your people, being connected with your people on a more personal level gives you the opportunity to be a little, a little worse at the other skills. <laughs> it doesn't mean you can't be great at everything, but you know, I, sometimes depend on my employees to be smarter than me well and, well your, your people yeah. what when you're when you're elevated to a leadership role you are no longer meant to be the expert of everything that gets done exactly. in your team you're you're yeah. expe- at that point you're facilitating the expertise of your team you you no longer have your hands so far down into the weeds that you know everything about what's happening you can't know everything that's happening in everyone's job, especially if you have a large team. And so you have to rely on the expertise of your people. They are the ones, you know, where the rubber meets the road, they're getting the work done. You're there to support them. You're there to help them. Maybe they're running ideas by you, um, getting your input, those sorts of things, but you can't do their work for them. Therefore you have to develop trust both ways so that they can feel empowered to do the work, be supported to do the work, uh, and get the feedback needed to be effective in the work that they do. Now, I wanted to tackle the other part of your question, the discussion about culture, right? That once you understand how to connect with people, which is part of culture, but I find that too many people like to throw this word around because every, at least anybody, any CEO under 45 is is ear or her dream is to have a great culture and the the vision that we're all often delivered is that google culture where people sit on bean bags and have great happy hours and play ping pong and somehow everybody's so awesomely productive but this is but this but when it comes to implement it within your company most people do not have a clear definition of what culture is they 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 understand it's you know, culture, you know, uh, getting people to to enjoy each other and work on it. And and the fact that there is no 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 uh, clear definition of culture prevents people from actually uh, building a, a appropriate one. And and I decided to actually in my book to provide a real definition, a, a real implement a, a real implementable definition for culture. And for me, culture means connection. When you understand that culture means connection, so connection to uh, connection to the company, so you're more, so you you have a deeper uh, loyalty to the company, connection to each other, to a team, so you have a better teamwork and connection to the client, right? When you understand that it's all about connection, suddenly you have a goal, and suddenly making the biggest, coolest party in the world for your employees is not necessarily what will create that higher connection. It will feed your ego really, really well. You can say that my company is the coolest thing in the world and coolest uh, party, but it's, but it's not necessarily what your employees need. And in the remote environment, you have a lot bigger challenges because you can't make cool parties and you can't make uh, always the coolest activities. If you can gather everybody from wherever they are and still have an activity, amazing. But if you have that limitation, you need to think about what creates the most connection. So in the, in, in the beginning, I, I was actually trying to make Zoom parties that everybody shows up and everybody needs to hold a drink. Uh, it doesn't have to be alcoholic. It could be coffee because we don't want to promote alcoholism. Uh, and, and, and it didn't work. It worked for a few times. And then my 
uh, my one of my managers said that it's becoming a conversation between all the managers, all the talkative managers, and everybody's like, ee, 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 you know, and and what I discovered later is that it's so much more powerful to have one on ones. And yes, it's a little more time consuming. And that means that I don't have with everybody, but my managers have with everybody. And having one-on-one Zoom drink and have a discussion is significantly more powerful and creates a much deeper connection. Also, one thing that really got in our company a huge connection is making sure that everybody gets a birthday gift. Sharon, it has just been a real pleasure talking with you. I know at the time I need to let you go and get back to your busy day. Um, we, we could go on and on and on because we've really only just scratched the surface. But before we close for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. So um, get connected with me. With their, if you need the best and the smartest employees in the world, which we go, we solicit, we head on t- across the world, please hit me up at Sharon at distantjob.com. If you just want to learn more about remote management, there's two ways. First of all, you can purchase my book, Surviving Remote Work. It's a number one bestseller on Amazon uh, and or come to thinkremote.com. We have a great podcast and we have a um, great content continuously. We were, we if we're not yet, we are trying to be the, the uh, premium content for anything related to remote work and remote management. And when, and the last best word that, that I can, that I can say is that the first step to becoming, to really getting remote work to function well in your company is to first appreciate, to, to, to know that, that this is an, an actual possible, possible opportunity to make your company better and not, uh, and not just another uh, forced reality that COVID has implemented us. If you have that mentality, that is a yeah. major step to succeed as remote managers and remote workers. I love it. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about uh, what Sharon and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital. 
exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.